Hello, I'm Gina Carr. I am the producer of Freedom Fest TV, and I'd like to welcome you all here today. Thank you so much for being with us. Let me just go over a couple of items. If you want to uh, comment in the chat bar, you're, uh, you're uh, welcome to do that. Just over on the right hand side, just just put whatever, whatever you'd like there. Of course, <laughs> keep it decent. You know, we need to keep it G-rated here. Uh, if you want to tweet, you'll see a little button up to the left where you can share the last uh, 30 seconds of whatever you heard. So if you hear Austin or Terry say something really brilliant, or one of our guests say something really brilliant, just click the little tweeter button up there and you can tweet out what's uh, gone on for the last 30 seconds. So that's a pretty cool uh, feature of Blab. Now, um, they're going to be chatting for a little bit and, and they'll have the seats locked, but then we're going to open up the seats and you can jump right in here and ask questions. So that's one of the great benefits of being on Freedom Fest TV that you can get up close and personal to our guests and come right on in. So, you know, tweet it out, get some more people in here because I know a lot of people need to know a lot more about Austin's message and the libertarian message. And we're just so excited that he could join us today. So with that, let me introduce you to our host. Our host is, is a former chief enterprise blogger of Skype and the former editor-in-chief of AT&T's big business blog, award-winning business blog. He's a certified speaking professional and a member of the National Speakers Association Hall of Fame. He speaks all over the world about technology and marketing and how you can help build better business relationships. With that, Terry, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Gina. And on behalf of Freedom Fest TV and everyone here, welcome. We're glad that you could join us today. We're going to have some fun today. And I've already had a lot of fun just uh, watching our guest today, seeing him from a distance, getting a chance to meet with him and talk with him. And we're going to learn a lot. We're going to have some fun. And don't forget, because we're using this technology called Blab, blab.im, it gives you the ability to come on screen and to ask questions. So get your questions ready to go. You can still make comments over in the live chat over on the right hand side. So as we go, if you've got a comment or you like something, you can do that. And by the way, a special feature of Blab, if you particularly like something that an individual is saying, you'll notice on their picture, the three of us that are on here right now, on the bottom right corner of each of our screens, you'll see some hands like that. And if you click on those hands, like I'm going to do this for Gina right now, that gives props to that person. It's like saying, hey, I'm giving some applause to the person over there. I like what you're saying. And it's a good way to gauge how we're doing. So for instance, if someone says, you know, I think that Oogie Womp should be the rule of the land. Well, and you like Oogie Womp, well, you can give applause to that. And we'll see lots of props there for Oogie Womps or whatever it might be. But our guest today is a person we're so glad to have with us. He is uh, Austin Peterson. And Austin Peterson is running for the Libertarian Party candidate for president of the United States in the 2016 election. He is well-spoken and seasoned even at the young age of 35, which is just perfect and right for election according to the United States Constitution. And so I think this is unique. You know, how many times do we have someone that's right there at that perfect age? I think it's great. He has a background working with companies like FAO Schwartz, Fox Business Network, working with Judge Andrew Napolitano, Freedom Works, and as an entrepreneur. And by the way, I have noticed he's especially skilled as an entrepreneur working with social media, with media in general. So a real asset to have someone like that in the party and involved. He was born in Independence, Missouri. Nice name for a libertarian, Independence, and grew up on a farm and lives in Peculiar, Missouri. That is the name for it, a real name, peculiar. I looked it up on Google. It's 30 miles south of Kansas City. And so you might want to look at it. But uh, being a Midwesterner myself, formerly from Michigan, I kind of relate to that. Now, his beliefs are pro-life, pro-liberty, and pro-constitution. He's a devoted student of the late, great Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman. And he also has a radical view that people should be legally able to live their own lives as they want, as long as they don't harm others, which I think is pretty decent. Austin Peterson, glad to have you with us today. Welcome aboard. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. That was a great intro. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, interesting introductions to who I am. Um, when they don't like me, when they're rude, they call me a blogger or, and a troll. But when they're, when they're nice, they, they mention uh, that I have had a few accomplishments at my young age. <laughs> well, you've had, and I'm just reading a few there. And by the way, those of you that are watching this, look him up. Could do a Google on Austin Peterson. That's with an E-N-S-E-N -E there at the end. And Austin Peterson, look up. He's done a lot. And Austin, we just really appreciate you 
you being here, taking time. I know you're busy. And we, by the way, I didn't mention he's joining us now from his home there in a hotel room. You know, now that he's on the road all the time, the home. And matter of fact, I looked around. I saw, gee, that looks like my second home. Yeah. I'm actually at home right now here, but it looks. I had to like take the ironing board down and all the all the clothes everywhere. Yeah, that's a good idea. The other thing is that we just don't want the world to see. That's okay, you know. But uh, well, as we get started, Austin, you're running for president. I want to ask you just kind of a general question. Why are you running and what is your basic platform in a nutshell of uh, wh what you believe the president of the United States should do? Well, I could probably list off a dozen reasons for why I'm running for president. And, you know, you shouldn't just have one, I think. But um, probably the main reason I'm running for president of the United States is because I was so frustrated with the options that we were having here in the United States. Uh, I saw uh, I, I really liked Rand Paul. I hoped that he had a better shot. Um, and, and at the end of last year, when I saw that there was likely not going to be a constitutionalist running for the highest office if Rand dropped out, and if it was Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton, who I very much see as two progressives, I said, well, what's the worst that could happen? I run for president of the United States, and what if I don't even win the nomination? At a minimum, I get a platform to talk about the issues that I care about, uh, and I'll go into that in just a second. Uh, but at best, I win the nomination, and I get to go full-blown pit bull on the uh, two main front runners, and hopefully build this movement and shock the American people's consciousness so that they awaken and hopefully start to return this country back to limited, gov limited government, uh, economic freedom, and personal liberty. So uh, what's my platform? Taking over the government to leave everyone alone. Um, you know, if I was going to rip off Donald Trump's phrase, I would say, I don't want to make America great again. I just want to let America be free again. And uh, the idea is, is that you own your life, you own your body, you ought to be able to do with it as you see fit, provided you harm no one else. This means things such as, as radical as getting rid of the IRS and the income tax, ending the war on drugs, getting rid of dr uh, gun regulations. Uh, and usually I only get 30 seconds in a debate to boil this all down. So sometimes I'll just say, I believe in a world where gay married couples can protect their marijuana fields with fully automatic machine guns. And uh, Absolutely. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's it. Very good. I like that. Well, then, unfortunately, we got more than 30 seconds. This is on the Internet. Now, we usually go for, I say, 30 minutes or so, which usually turns into an hour or more. But uh, you don't have any time constraints on you right now. Okay. So if you've got something you want to mention and you want to add it, by all means, we want we want to hear from you. Okay? Right. And that's why we're interviewing in Freedom Fest. We're interviewing the top three candidates for the Libertarian Party. You, John McAfee, Gary Johnson. We're working to get all of those lined up. And we want to give you a, a chance, an opportunity to to say unedited, uh, no bridles at all, what you uh, have to say. So let me ask you this. What do you see as the proper role of government? The role of government is to protect our liberties. Our liberties are defined as, our, as natural rights. Those natural rights are more numerous than the stars. And the Founding Fathers knew this because that's why they wrote the Ninth Amendment. The idea was that the uh, powers of government, I always say powers of government because states do not have rights, only individuals have rights, and states' powers are strictly limited. But the rights of the people are more numerous than could be written down, which is why we have a Ninth Amendment. So basically what it means is, is that if anything is not strictly forbidden in the United States, it shall be permitted. Uh, and that is uh, the kind of governments, governance that I am interested in restoring here in the United States. Uh, nowadays, we have a, you know, a, a sort of false dichotomy between left and right where everything that uh, uh, is everything that liberals don't like is banned. Everything they like is subsidized. And with conservatives, it's the same thing. Everything they don't like is banned. Everything that they like is subsidized. Libertarians say subsidize nothing and ban only that which causes harm to other people. Yeah, I like the way you put that because we think of uh, you before we got started, you and I mentioned a president that uh, we, well, I certainly didn't vote for, and that was Teddy Roosevelt, or as he likes to be called, Theodore Roosevelt, but I'll call him Teddy. But uh, he felt that he should be able to do anything as long as the Constitution didn't say that the president couldn't do it and giving the power to the government, you tend to take an attitude of more liberty for people. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, the idea is, is that, again, if the Constitution doesn't expressly, uh, expressly grant a power, then you cannot act and you cannot act without an act of legislation, without proper legislation. Uh, and at the moment, it feels as if the executive branch has gone the other way. Of course, uh, Richard Nixon said it very plainly when he says, if the president does it, then it's not illegal. Uh, and so he's very much a progressive in that sense. Uh, and uh, also a Keynesian, which is another interesting topic, something that I like to talk about. But uh, to me, again, I, uh, I always talk about why I want to expand human freedom. 
because freedom is about trust and love and kindness to our fellow man. Because if we, if we, freedom means that we can be trusted to engage in commerce, it means that we can be trusted to have contracts between consenting adults, no matter what their gender may be, or to take any, you know, smoke any plant or imbibe any alcohol or take any drug. Again, provided we harm no one else. Yeah, I think it make sure that we have that, providing you're not harming anyone else. But now, wait a minute, there are those who would say, but we need the government there to help regulate what we're going to put into our bodies because people could get hurt and there could be something bad happen to people if they ingest the wrong thing. And wouldn't we need uh, government for that? How would you answer people that uh, talk about that? Well, I would just fall back on Thomas Jefferson that said, I would rather be exposed to the inconveniences of too much liberty than of too little. That makes sense. Now, there are those also that say, now, but wait a minute, Austin, they would say we need government to uh, allocate resources because, the, the, as they would say, the rich need to pay their fair share. That's a phrase we hear from them a lot. The government needs to be there to make sure they pay their fair share to help the poor and help those who are not able to uh, get by or maybe not as privileged as some of the others would be the terms they use. How would you respond to people that are uh, act, you know, talking about that in today's election? These are the same people who think that uh, the government spending in World War II got us out of the Great Depression. Uh, it's really hard to argue against people who have been indoctrinated to think a certain way. We have a very state positive uh, educational system here in the United States. So it doesn't it doesn't surprise me that people have a state positive viewpoint on things. Uh, it's very difficult for us to break people out of their indoctrination uh, when it comes to government allocation of resources. Well, you know, big corporations absolutely love that. You know why? Because when they get the money, they, they get the money first. Uh, and, uh, you know, it comes from the Federal Reserve. And then as the money finally trickles down through the marketplace, as you get the money, if you're on Social Security or a fixed income, then uh, that money is worth less and buys less. But the people, the big banks and the big corporations who are getting the allocations of cash, who are getting the too big to fail, who are getting the stimulus uh, government allocation of resources, which is what we're talking about here, they benefit first. They get money at its at its peak value. Uh, but the American people, the individuals, the, the poor, the middle class, uh, the elderly, those on fixed incomes, they they are harmed directly by a system of redistribution of wealth, uh, which is sold to us as something to help the poor or the middle class. It's They give you just enough benefits, just enough cheese uh, to make the mousetrap very appealing. There's always free cheese in a mousetrap. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's right. That is the only place you find the free cheese, yeah. because as Milton Friedman, uh, someone that you admire and many of us admire, said, you know, that uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, and he kept uh, letting us know that. Well, as we're looking at the economic side, what kind of economic plans would a Peterson administration suggest and advance forward to Congress to say this is what we feel should be done to really stimulate the economy, to help people to have more freedom, to hire people and to make sure those that are wanted work are able to get more work, uh, whether it's a full-time job or, as is said now, the gig economy, what would you recommend? Well, I really appreciate the way that you phrased that question, first of all, because you didn't ask me what I would do. You asked me what I would suggest to Congress that they should do, because Congress writes the law. Uh, yes. So when it comes to what I would suggest to Congress, uh, I'm very interested in having a monetary commission, something like what Ronald Reagan did in the 1980s. He had a gold commission because Ron Paul wanted to return to uh, the United States, return to a gold standard, which I disagree with. But I can understand his attempt to, to have some sort of a, of a fiscal restraint. But to me, I think we need to look more towards the monetary ideas espoused by uh, economists by the name of Friedrich Hayek, who wanted a free market monetary policy. And what this means is that if we were to have a monetary policy commission in my administration, uh, that one would be a return to a free banking system in the United States, similar to what we had in, during the Gilded Age, uh, but not precisely, because during the Gilded Age of the United States, we had, um, you know, we had a gold standard, but it was a free banking, a semi-free banking state uh, standard where in the, the states, the, the state banks were set up and you in order to uh, in order to issue currency, you had to be chartered by your state bank. Now, in Scotland, during the 1700s, they had a the more free bank banking style of monetary policy, which was literally that any bank could set up their own bank and they could um, they could issue their own currency. So I'd like digital currencies in the modern age. I'd like to see digital currencies like Bitcoin. I'd like to see gold and silver taken off the commodity list and allowed to flow, uh, allowed to freely compete against the Federal Reserve's notes. This is a way that I think we would, in, in essence, we would force them to to be inflation hawks. 
uh, rather than to be incentivized to, uh, to, to stimulate and to inflate. Uh, if we were to abolish laws of legal tender, for example, uh, then perhaps uh, these digital currencies could come in. People might find them a more acceptable use. Maybe everybody would go to PayPal. I don't know. The point is, is that I don't have to know because I'm not going to be centrally planning the economy. I'm simply going to be removing the barriers to access uh, for institutions to to rise up in competition against these central banks. I don't think we need a central bank at all whatsoever. I'd love to end the Fed, but I think the best way to do it without causing a massive destabilization of our economy uh, would be to allow alternative institutions to rise up so that we could sort of uh, hop off the ship. Uh, as you know, have another boat to jump on while this one's going down. Yeah. So in other words, we give a free market of various kinds of values. If someone says, I would rather trade in gold and silver and they want to, that's their business. Someone else says, I want Bitcoin or maybe someone chooses Federal Reserve notes or maybe I decide to use uh, pots and pans. And if you and I agree, we're going to do it for X number of pots and pans. That's uh, between us. Right. Or, money in is, other words, money let the free market do it. Government originally money originated from the free market economy and that's where it should return. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I can see that there would be a lot of uh, uh, development on that. It'd be a, a fun way to see it uh, move. Well, let's take a look at some of the uh, foreign policy that people talk about a lot. And that's, of course, a big factor. Right now, the United States has troops stationed in over 140 countries around the world. We're engaged in wars currently, as we're recording this, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria, and who knows what else. And they're looking at other areas where they do it. And of course, they're saying it's for our own security. What are your thoughts on that? And what would you do under a Peterson administration uh, regarding our foreign policy and wars in the military? Well, firstly, let me say unequivocally that under no circumstances would I ever allow the national security of the United States to be threatened under my administration. That being said, I do believe that it is possible for us to have a national defense that's focused on defense rather than one that's focused on militarism. And what I mean when I say that is that we have not had an audit of our Department of Defense since before 9-11. Uh, unquestionably, there is some waste, fraud, and abuse going on at most of these institutions at the federal level. Uh, if they're not receiving an audit, we cannot know uh, exactly where that's all coming from. So what I would like to do is perform an audit of our Department of Defense, find out what trim, where the fat can be trimmed, and for us to start trimming the fat in many of these institutions. Uh, take a look at our F-35 program. The F-35 uh, Joint Strike Fighter was to be the, the end-all be-all of uh, fighter jets uh, to replace the F-16. But the F-35 cost us $1.5 trillion. And it, yeah, yeah, and the F-16 uh, jet that it was meant to replace has, has uh, outpaced it uh, in tests. So it's been a boondoggle. Even Senator McCain has come out against this recently. Uh, what, a, what a nightmare to the American taxpayers this has been. So these are the kinds of wasteful spending on programs that I think we need to cut. Uh, I don't really see the United States going towards a first generation warfare approach. It's not if we need state on state type of, uh, of uh, military equipment, we already have plenty. And uh, to, to my understanding, what we're fa facing now are insurgencies. Uh, these insurgencies should be combated, but they should be done uh, constitutionally. And there are ways for us to protect our national security without endangering uh, uh, our, consti our constitutional due processes. For example, we have a drone war going on that is, in essence, it's a blanket war that is unending and allows the president of the United States to extrajudicially assassinate people such as American citizen Anwar al-Awlaki. I'm not saying that al-Awlaki was a good guy. He probably was not. He was probably engaged in a lot of dangerous activities. However, the fact that the president of the United States can simply press a button and assassinate someone without there being another branch of government involved is troubling. I think it's important for us to reassert due process and to find a more constitutional way for us to protect our national defense. Uh, but again, uh, to me, it seems that what, be, what is a blanket war on terror, one that is at all times everywhere in the world, that, is, that will eventually become a war on our own people as there has been the crackdown on civil liberties here, uh, such as the NSA's warrantless wiretapping programs, this in effect blanket warrants, which is basically what, one of the major reasons we fought the revolution against King George, uh, risk of assistance. Uh, so we need to we need to ensure that our defense policy aligns with constitutional principles.
Yeah, something about that uh, Fourth Amendment that is, uh, I think, supposed to be still in force and uh, making sure that we have that protection would be there. Well, now, when we look at the military, you have proposed some solutions that uh, some people who are very knowledgeable, the military, have agreed with, and that is using more special forces to get uh, the work done in today's environment, realizing we're not fighting World War II again. You've recommended that. Your father, being a former Green Beret himself, uh, is there, so you have a view on that. Tell us a little bit about your feeling on the role of special forces and what they would play in today's world and as we look to the 2020s, 2030s and beyond. Certainly. So uh, my first proposal that I have made, which is rather controversial, is to use not current uh, special forces, but former special forces. Uh, many of the many of our uh, highly trained and highly paid, very expensive assets that we have paid to train here in the United States, former Delta, former SEALs, uh, are just itching to do us a favor and go and take care of uh, ISIS, who are a very real threat to the United States. Uh, and so in order for us to do that and, and to align with constitutional principles, we should take a uh, we should look at Article one, Section eight of the United States Constitution, which allows the Congress, not the president, allows the Congress to call up letters of mark and reprisal. A letter of mark is uh, exactly what it sounds like. If you've ever heard this phrase, he's a marked man or he's got a mark on his head. Uh, in essence, it is an assassination program, uh, but the difference between a letter of mark uh, and something like what President Obama does with the drone war, the difference is that it is constitutional and it involves another branch of government. It is not the president pushing a button and killing someone. It is the Congress writing it, off, writing it off, saying it's a real threat. We have deliberation. We have democratic due process. We have a debate in Congress. And then once that has been done, if the letter of mark is to be issued, the president can sign it if he believes that it is in our national security interest. I have no time or patience for those who threaten uh, the, the interests or the security of the, peop of the people of the United States. As president, I will preserve and protect our, uh, our nation, but I will do so according to constitutional uh, authority, and I will not expand authority of the executive branch outside the constitutional purview. Yeah, well, you know, in uh, I believe it was 75 that Gerald Ford uh, had an executive order that assassinations are uh, not allowed. And out there, would you uh, see yourself uh, changing that or uh, embracing that? What would be your role regarding that? Yes, I'm a bit, I'm, I hate to say I'm a bit cold hearted, but, uh, you know, it's just like if someone breaks into your house with a gun, it's uh, am I going to sit there and, and worry about whether or not, uh, you know, I'm going to hurt anyone's feelings or am I going to pull out my AR-15 and shoot you? Uh, at some at some level, you know, it's 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 us or them. Um, and you do have to have a real national security plan. You do have to defend yourselves. I think it's ridiculous. Of course, of course, political leaders are going to sign a law that says don't no assassinations of other political leaders. Of course, political leaders want to make it uh, illegal for them to uh, be assassinated. Uh, I don't I can't see our founding fathers signing any sort of a uh, of an executive order such as that. Uh, I think it's ridiculous because to me, it's it really is speaks to the sort of the weakness of American culture because we we cannot, we, it's just like the way we would do the death penalty, for example. Um, so, so I'm against the death penalty. Uh, but if you're going to have the death penalty, why not do it in the public square? You know, why not do it so that everybody has to see it? And, in, and instead of having it to be this sterile, because because really the death penalty is about vengeance. It's not about um, it's not about uh, 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 just punishment. It's not just a, it's not about teaching people a lesson or like trying to deter crime because it's proven that that doesn't work. Uh, right. it, it's just about vengeance. And it's just about, uh, you know, it's about punishing people and making ourselves feel good. So if we're going to do it like that, why do we why do we make it so clinical? Uh, why do we have to uh, just give them a lethal injection? Uh, we certainly didn't do it to the Nazis. You put them up against a pole and we shot them. Uh, when it came to when it comes to ISIS, they have the same sort of uh, uh, they have the same sort of principles. Uh, they put people in cages and burn them to death. Uh, so again, if you're talking about when it comes to war, war is hell, war is barbarism. Uh, and if someone has declared war on you, then I have. I mean, again, no compunction. I get in a lot of trouble with libertarians because, again, when I when I fight, I fight to win. And uh, if it's a true war of an existential threat, you you cannot pull punches. I'm not saying we should burn people in cages. I'm simply saying that you know our enemies give us no quarter. And there there does appear to be this this attempt by people in the United States to sort of take the um, 
to, to make killing kind or, or gentle or sweet. Uh, and, uh, you know, terrorists don't give us those, uh, those kinds of quarters. So when it comes to defending the national security of the United States, if I am unfortunately called to war as president of the United States, I will win decisively, quickly, and end it. And I will come home with no nation building. Yeah, and I think since we've got you here online, a question that I've had and uh, thoughts that I've had, I really appreciate your thoughts on this. We all understand and know about the non-aggression principle, that it is immoral to initiate, keyword, initiate force of coercion. Defending yourself, absolutely. And I think it was Ayn Rand who shared a lot of insight that she said that we don't have to wait for the bombs flying through the air to say they have initiated. If we see them mobilizing, that is initiation of force. Exactly. And when we see uh, it, I think if we clearly understand we're not going to initiate force and we embrace the non-aggression principle fervently, we're not going to attack. But there's, they don't have to just pull the trigger and wait for the bullet to come flying through the air before we react. Would you? How would you react to that? In essence, you're, you're correct. There is a bit of murkiness with, uh, surrounding the non-aggression principle because when you're talking about the initiation of force, of uh, uh, Force is one thing. I consider it violence. But when you talk about aggression, aggression is something that's a bit of a blanket term. There's many different forms of aggression. And I think that some libertarians perhaps have taken it too far. Uh, and, and I know this because when I argue, I've argued literally with some people who said that when can we uh, fire? He, he considers himself an anarchist. And so we were talking about North Korea and whether or not if we can retaliate if North Korea threatens us with nuclear weapons. So at some point I'm saying, OK, so let's say North Korea puts a bomb on a launch pad. Can we blow it off the launch pad? And he's like, no. And I said, okay, what if they launch it? And let's say that they launch the launch pad, right? This is someone who believes in no government. Say, so what if they launch the, the missile and it's coming towards us in the United States? Then can we shoot it down? He's like, yes, then you can shoot it out of the sky. I'm like, with what Air Force? Because you have no government, you've created no Air Force, you have no national defense, you cannot shoot the weapon down out of the sky. Um, I do believe that someone who has a reasonable idea that there's a reasonable threat that you have the right to retaliate. I, 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 I'm not a pacifist. And uh, I think that pacifism is uh, people who are pacifists, people who, who don't, uh, who decry the use of force whatsoever. Uh, they're protected by people who don't. Uh, the Amish in our country are very, I love the fact that we have this community here in the United States and they should be free to to live their, their lives as they see fit. But those people benefit from the force of the U.S. military, whether they know that or not. It's just the truth. So we do need a national defense. But I don't think that we need to be engaged in endless permanent war, occupation, nation building. The Republicans go in and they fight the war and they break things and they kill people. And then the Democrats move in and then they want to set up shop and install democracy. That really shouldn't be the role, the role of the U.S. military. I think we need a more humble foreign policy. But when it comes to national security, if, if there is constitutional process, if we have if we have a, a clear, concise threat that is uh, not something like what we had with Iraq, where it was a very tenuous um, uh, connection between Al Qaeda and Saddam Hussein, which we found out later not to be true, then uh, I think that if we have a real threat that is confirmed, then we should dis act decisively in our national security interests. Otherwise, follow the law, obey the Constitution, and stay out of foreign, a foreign affairs. Just stay out of it. Something that we heard from Washington and Franklin and uh, Jefferson, as well as uh, other presidents through the years. For those of you that are joining us, we're talking with Austin Peterson. He is a candidate for president in the Libertarian Party for the election 2016. And we're talking to him about a variety of issues. And one of the things that we want to do today is to hear from you. We now have a seat standing by. And if you are joining us, we would love to have you click on that. Come on in seat. Then you can join us live and direct if you have have a question you want to ask to Austin Peterson, or we would request, please keep that short and make it a question, not a statement that goes for three hours about your political position. We would like to hear from uh, that. So if you would like to join us and you're there on board, by all means, just click on that button and come on aboard because we would like to hear from you. And I think we have Gina Carr, our engineer in chief here at Freedom Fest TV to help us out. Gina, uh, comments, questions, uh, what can we do to help you? Oh, yeah. Well, I just wanted to say, you know, um, gosh, I agree with Austin on so many things. Uh, Terry and I have listened to you on the debate and uh, the forum and then seen several of your videos and definitely, um, you know, we love what, what your your attitudes and your policies and your preferences about things. Um, in particular, 
yeah, I was curious to hear your thoughts on the death penalty because uh, I, I, I used to think death penalty was a good deterrent. And now I believe that there's so many people who've been uh, sentenced to death that are actually innocent. And this is something that really causes me a lot of concern and, and just put it under the category of the criminal justice system, the uh, corrupt prosecutors, judges, police, um, all the people who are innocent, who are behind bars, and and even those who aren't innocent, but the way that they're treated, I, I just, I just, it just tears me up. Yes, the the problem is with people who support the death penalty is that they have to argue that the government never makes a mistake, uh, because if they say that yes, the government makes a mistake, then they have to say essentially that they are perfectly okay with punishing innocent people in order to exact vengeance. And right, even killing innocent people. Correct. They have to say, I'm perfectly okay with killing innocent people as long as you give me the right to exact vengeance on people who I despise, who have perhaps committed heinous acts, uh, pedophiles, murderers, whatever you might, you may, they may be. Then you have to say, okay, I need to kill as many innocent people as it's as I need to in order to exact vengeance. It's not it's not quite a moral philosophy. It's not a just philosophy. And I think that we need to be in it in order to be this advanced civilization that is worthy of protecting and preserving. We need to uh, we need to have a strong sense of justice and hold ourselves above our enemies. Again, we are not ISIS. We don't burn our people in cages or drown them in cages. And why? Why do we not do that? Again, is it because we are we are um, a better civilization? Do we realize that we are? Well, then fine. Well, then why must we execute people once we have them in a cage at all? Uh, as to me, I, again, it's it speaks to an immorality of, on the people that they would that anyone would say yes, I would I would punish a guilty man or an innocent man in order to get at a guilty man. Uh, it's it's it, to me unjust. Yeah, yeah, it really really bothers me and. And hearing Donald Trump on the debate stage talk about, uh, yeah, we're going to waterboard and more. And I mean, and, and then seeing all the people that support that, it really gives me a concern about our entire society. Well, it's, yeah, well you know, he never served, obviously, he never served in the military. He got deferments for the draft in Vietnam. Uh, and so it's interesting, you know, if he, he needs to, maybe he should go ask his, uh, his old sparring partner, John McCain, about, uh, about being tortured. And John McCain knows firsthand and is one of the biggest advocates against torture and waterboarding here in the United States. So uh, maybe we should, uh, maybe uh, Donald Trump should submit himself to being waterboarded and make change his mind. I've seen people do that. Uh, Christopher Hitchens was a perfect example of someone who was in favor of waterboarding until it was done to him, uh, and then he changed his mind. But of course, it's not just about the fact that it is immoral for us to torture prisoners. It also just doesn't provide ac good, actionable intelligence. Uh, you know, I'll tell you anything you want to hear if you put my head under into a bathtub. I'll tell you anything you want to hear or anything you want to know. Call me Susie. You know, <laughs> I'll say anything that you want to say. So the problem is, is that you don't get the, the type of information that you want, because if you lead a witness, if you're if you're torturing them, they'll say anything you want to that, uh, you know, they'll say anything that you want. So not only is it wrong, but it also is ta it tactically doesn't work. Yeah, I think also you raise a good point. And a lot of people that I've heard uh, in intelligence and in uh, the business of uh, finding information of what's going on, what's going on going on and on that uh, that the torture really is not reliable we'll go ahead and say anything to stop the torture yeah it was bob over here that did it and so that way they'll stop the torture and we'll uh, say whatever we can and i think what we've got to do is look at what's going to be effective and also what can we do to increase liberty as our uh, person that you and i both admire pin gillette talks about when we have a problem rather than saying what government program do we need for this? What should we have the government do here? Rather, we should ask the question, how can we increase freedom and be able to solve this problem? I'm paraphrasing him right now. And Penn, if you're watching this, uh, please excuse me for butchering that. But uh, the idea of how to increase freedom, what are your thoughts on that philosophy and that way of uh, approaching problems? Yeah, it just betrays, yes, most people who say that the government should do this or the government should do that, it sort of betrays a fundamental lack of understanding of what government really is. Uh, government is force. Government is fire. It's a fearful master and a dangerous servant. Uh, the Most people, if you say, oh, should we raise taxes on cigarettes and we'll use the money to fund schools, they'll say, yes, oh, that's a great idea. So smoking is bad. This maybe this might reduce smoking. And besides, the money is going to be used to uh, to help the children. The problem with that is, of course, is that if you are tying a revenue source to a revenue stream you're trying to kill, well, then in the future, as more people die, uh, uh, you'll have less money to uh, as 
you'll have less money for schools because you're tying it to a dying revenue stream. Uh, also, the problem is, is that when you talk about something like, oh, do black lives matter? Remember that uh, the ultimate, the ultimate po power flows out of the barrel of a gun. And so in order to enforce the tax, you have to kill people like Eric Garner who was uh, killed on the streets of New York City by the NYPD because he had, was selling loose cigarettes. Uh, I've been very successful in converting liberals uh, by uh, talking to them about this with saying, when you raise taxes, just remember Eric Garner. Just remember, I can't breathe. Just remember that because that is mm. ultimately what you are asking for. Never say there ought to be a law without following it up with, and I'm ready to kill to enforce it. Yeah, I think that's what it ultimately comes down to, because when we say there ought to be a law, you're talking about force. Mm -hmm. You're talking about government coming in and using force on that. When we talk about that among ourselves, and it sounds uh, very radical to a lot of people, which is why I want to lead to another question here for you. Uh, the reality that uh, we get often, people say, yeah, but, uh, you know, the libertarians are good. I agree with a lot. They say, but I don't want to throw my vote away. There's that phrase that they'll use. Don't want to throw the vote away. You've got to vote for one or the other, either a Democrat or a Republican, and uh, they uh, say that you're wasting your vote on a libertarian. What are your thoughts on that? I ask them usually, my first question is, is would you rather throw away your vote or would you rather throw away your principles? Uh, and the question is, is that if you vote for Donald Trump or you vote for Hillary Clinton, you are absolutely, if you can believe in limited government whatsoever, or you don't consider yourself a progressive, you're throwing away your principles. Uh, and there, it's not as if there aren't other options. And the question is, is do you want to affect change in this country? I think the question belies a misunderstanding of our, uh, of our electoral system. People think that it doesn't do anything if you, if you vote for a third party candidate. Actually, your vote counts more for a third party candidate than for one of the two main party candidates, especially if you live in a state that's not a swing state. Uh, because if you're in California, for example, uh, voting for a Republican will do nothing. But voting for a libertarian energizes the party. Uh, it could result in increased ballot access for that libertarian candidate. Uh, and it could involve a, uh, a potential shot at federal matching funds and putting the libertarian party on the electoral map as a national party. So whenever someone says your vote, uh, you're throwing away your vote, just let them know that one, the moral issue, throwing, they're throwing away their principles. And two, that the truth is, is that a vote for a third party counts more than a vote for the two major parties. Yeah, I would have to agree with you on that, Austin. And a uh, matter of fact, let's take it even deeper. We've heard that argument. What you just said, we could have said in many previous elections on that. But this one is even different. The election that we have now in 2016, and I think that you've created a real sharp contrast in where the Libertarian Party is coming from and those that embrace freedom versus, as you call them, the two progressives, Clinton and Trump, that are the most likely candidates for the Republican Democrat Party. And so given that we have that this year, it seems like even more than ever, it's important to understand maybe we do have a chance. Maybe there's something different. Uh, I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts on that for 2016 election, even more than previous elections we've seen. I don't think that the opportunities have ever been better for the Libertarian Party because of the rise of the Never Trump movement. Um, the Libertarian, uh, Donald Trump said something the other day, every once in a while Donald Trump, the, the blind squirrel finds a nut. Um, and he says something that really makes perfect sense. Uh, he, he said that the Republican Party is not the conservative party. Uh, to us, he was absolutely right, but it was because of his, of his monumental victory that the Republican Party is no longer a, um, is no longer a conservative party. It is now what we might call a, a nationalist populist party. And what do I mean when I say that? These are people who are a blind nationalist. Uh, to me, nationalism, love of country, has always been a means to an end. Uh, it's something which gives us the ability to unify, for example, if we have to defend ourselves in, in war or to defend our constitutional principles, uh, then I think that nationalism can be useful. But to them, it's more... Uh, uh, God bless America and uh, and wave the flag, rah, 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 with no actual principles underneath it, which turns uh, d d democratic populism can will always turn bad. And, and we saw with the rise of the Tea Parties in 2010, there was a very tenuous uh, coalition of conservatives and libertarians and populists. That coalition broke apart when the unprincipled populists the, turned the, uh, the debate away from the issue of Obamacare and fiscal conservatism and towards the issue of immigration and towards the issue of um, uh, uh, foreign policy, 
which divided the Tea Party movement, allowing for the unprincipled populace to take hold of power in the Republican Party. Whereas the, in, Pat Buchanan was, was unsuccessful uh, at winning the Republican Party as on a sort of populist platform. Uh, Donald Trump, by dog whistling to the ethno-nationalists, has, uh, has now given rise to this movement, which very, was very fascinating because, of course, Donald Trump is in no way a sort of a, uh, a, a populist conservative uh, nationalist. In, this, in essence, he's more of a, of a uh, liberal. He's more of a New York liberal in many ways. But because of the dog whistles to the KKK, because of the dog whistles to, uh, to the, uh, the, what we might call just the simple anti-establishmentarian movement, these are people who care nothing for, our, for the constitutional processes. They care for nothing about American traditions. They care only for destroying uh, with the establishment that we have with, uh, with nothing better to put in place. I don't know if you all saw um, the Heath Ledger version of The Joker. Uh, but it's very much that mindset. If, if you've seen the Christopher Nolan version of Batman, and, and I, I highly recommend you watch it, there's a lot of good philosophy in it. But Heath Ledger's character, the Joker, was a, a chaotic madman. And he was, in, in terms of Dungeons and Dragons alignment, I know I'm d- dating my, my, myself here at the age, but in terms of Dungeons and Dragons alignment, this is someone who would, you would consider chaotic evil on the range of, of their type of, um, of, of their alignment. And Donald Trump may not be chaotic evil. He would consider, I would consider him more chaotic neutral, meaning that he will do, he will cause chaos for whatever ends that he wants on, at whatever time or, or place. But the people that he represents, the, the, the mass movement of populism that he has stirred up uh, are, are, is an evil movement. And now we see on our left, the forces of democratic socialism. And to our right, the forces of democratic populism uh, preparing to go to war, which is why I've built an army of libertarian freedom ninjas. So if I win this nomination, I've built a very powerful army of activists at my back who are ready to go to war. Um, Again, I'm going to bring up another nerdy reference here, but it's sort of like Lord of the Rings uh, at the two towers when when at the very end, the final battle comes and uh, humans uh, are are all uh, broken apart. Uh, but Gandalf says, look to my coming in the east on the third day. And, and uh, finally, the forces of light and goodness come and save save us. And that is what I'm trying to do is to marshal the forces of light and love and freedom and liberty and, and uh, go to war. I, I don't think that my opponents who are running for this nomination understand fully the uh, the true battle of good and evil that we are engaged in right now. I don't think that they're prepared for the kind of battle or the kind of vitriol or hatred or the, the real danger that, that the whoever the Libertarian Party candidate is will face. As a matter of fact, I, I'd hate to sound like a you know, a bit of a demagogue here, but at the risk of that, uh, I'm going to say right now that I'm trying to save Governor Gary Johnson and John McAfee from what will be the absolute terror of dealing with Trump's minions. Who, If you have seen these people online, they are a dangerous force to be reckoned with. And only my people, I believe, will be able to neutralize the effect of these ethno-nationalists who want nothing but destruction. Mm, well, we appreciate your thoughts. And of course, at Freedom Fest, we're not embracing any particular candidate right now, but we do applaud freedom and liberty. And uh, Austin, we appreciate the time, the money, the energy that you personally are putting in to uh, propagate the cause of liberty and freedom. We thank you for that, thank for what you're doing. Thank you very much. And, yeah, so absolutely. You, you and yes, yeah, speaking of that, um, I do want to tell people that uh, if you're coming to the Libertarian Party, convention here in Orlando. Uh, Terry and I live in Orlando. Um, we're, the Freedom Fest folks are going to have a special party. I'm proud to announce that Austin is going to be our keynote speaker for our party. Yes, thank you, Austin. It's going to be at Cuba Libre Restaurant on uh, uh, Thursday night, the 28th. Uh, I'm not sure what night that is, but it's Thursday night at the Libertarian Party Convention. 26th. 26th, okay. Maybe the 26th and, Thursday. Uh, so if you're coming to Freedom Fest, if you're already registered, you're going to get an invitation. But just know that if you're part of the Freedom Fest uh, family, if you're here watching Freedom Fest TV, you're you're welcome to to come to the party with us. So we're going to, um, you know, we'd like to have you there. And, and another great thing is, you know, Austin is going to be a speaker at Freedom Fest. And one of the beautiful things about Freedom Fest is folks like Austin and Gary Johnson and John McAfee and Steve Forbes and um, Rand Paul, others will just be walking around Freedom Fest, the exhibit areas, just talking. You can just walk right up to them and talk to them directly. So it's the next best thing to Freedom Fest TV where we're talking to them right here. But uh, but you'll be able to walk and talk. And so we're excited about so many exciting things going on. If you haven't registered yet, go to FreedomFest.com. 
And when you get to the opportunity for a discount code, enter FFTV, that's all caps, FFTV, and you get $100 off your registration. And, uh, and you know, why come alone? You can bring somebody else for just another $300. So it might say, uh, you know, bring another person. It doesn't have to be a spouse or a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It can be, just be a friend. So bring a friend for another $300. And um, with that, I, I do have one final question. Um, you know, Austin, you were talking about your ninja, your ninja warriors, <laughs> and I'm a social, Terry and our social media is part of our uh, expertise, so we, we study it, and I particularly study Facebook groups, and I've noticed that of all the candidates, you have a really impressive Facebook group. Is that a core part of what you're doing? Do you mind just talking about that just a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the na it's the nature of social movements that you have to have cohesiveness amongst your people. Uh, and I've studied social movements in the United States for quite a long time. And I noticed that there are certain traits and characteristics of what successful, um, that successful social movements have in order to actually affect change. They have to have fairly narrow uh, topics they have that they are uh, aligned on. They have to have uh, a basic, broad understanding, general consensus on what it is that they're fighting for. Those goals have to be narrow and, and fairly simply stated so that you can build a broad coalition rather than to have some sort of a nebulous uh, task for everyone to do. Let's just advance liberty. At the moment, my army is focused on winning the libertarian presidential nomination. You know, when that is completed, these people will then be put it up, uh, focused on uh, advocating for my ascension to the White House at the end of this year. Uh, and of course, if, I, if for some reason I am not nominated, uh, then um, we will have a new focus for these people in order for them to stay productive, stay active, and for them to stay focused on advancing liberty. And that will be announced uh, after the convention. But uh, I've got a good feeling I might just win this thing. So we'll see. <laughs> uh, but well, we'll I've seen a number of polls, and it uh, looks like you, you've built quite a coalition out there. So oh, yeah. uh, you know, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, Terry, I see the Austin uh, uh, Ian, one of our uh, great Freedom Fest TV supporters, has asked a question. He says, uh, "What's your topic at speaking about at Freedom Fest?" That's a good question. I haven't decided yet because it depends on what what position I'm in. Obviously, if I'm running if I'm running a general election cam campaign for president of the United States, it's you know why I should uh, be the person to bring us into a new era of liberty. Why uh, uh, limited government and constitutionalism is the way forward for the United States. Uh, but if it's if, if for some reason it's not, maybe I'll do something a little bit more wild and 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 I'll have a new plan for uh, the libertarian move, movement in the short term. Perhaps it's something that might help uh, whoever the nominee is, if it's Governor Gary Johnson or John McAfee, some sort of new strategy or tactics so that they can have a better uh, chance at winning the White House. Uh, but I haven't quite decided that just yet. Yeah, okay. well, that's fair enough. I think that's good. I yeah. noticed that we have that question. We love the questions we're getting over here in our live chat. Austin, are you seeing those over on the right side there of the yeah, screen? Fantastic uh, question over there, and it's something that came up in the, the debate yesterday with Penn Jillette. Yeah, very good. And by the way, we also want to mention as we're going, we're going to be winding down in just a bit. We do have a seat open right now for those of you that are joining us live. If you would like to come in on screen and be there, we would love to have you. You're welcome to come on. You just click and then we'll uh, make a couple of clicks here and you'd be able to talk to Austin Peterson, who theoretically could be the next president of the United States. And then you would be able to say, hey, I talked to him back when he was running for office and you would have that opportunity. So, I mean, Austin, that is theoretically possible. Isn't I know it? there's a danger of that happening, and it gets more, it gets scarier and scarier. Um, you know, yesterday in the debate, you know, Penn Jillett came in and, and uh, asked me a very good question, which was, you know, you came into this with no name recognition, at, at least much less name recognition than the two uh, other front runners, and you know, and now yet you've made it into two national debates. You know, what is your secret? And the truth is, is that I am really the vessel of the liberty movement. The people who are who are active out there. The only way that I've been able to raise enough money money to continue or to build a campaign and we have done very well with fundraising is to connect with the people uh, a Saul Alinsky who is a very radical organizer in the 1960s yeah. said that a revolution without money must be built with flesh and blood uh, and it's because of the tens of thousands of supporters and activists that are connected to my campaign who are pushing every single day you know I, I may not be able to roll this rock up the uh, the mountain like Sisyphus, I may not be able to roll it up myself, but with the help of ten thousand people behind me, 
we can all push it together. And that's how I've been able to be successful. Uh, so yes, there is now actually what I believe a real danger that I might get elected because the two front runners are so unpopular. And um, yeah, so uh, I, I always said to my supporters, I'm like, if you want me to stop, just stop donating and stop getting active. And they just they just keep pushing. So I'm going to keep going forward. And now it feels almost like they're pushing me towards the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Did, you're doing uh, a lot. And I apologize. I might have been doing some engineering work if you guys already talked about this. I don't think you talked about specifically the um, the other debates that are expected in the fall, where right now the Libertarians, uh, even though there's a lot of interest, they're saying, oh, if you don't have the 15 percent, you can't come on. Is there any uh, movement? Because, gosh, I would love so much to see you or whoever the Libertarian Party candidate is up there talking about these, uh, you know, saying the word freedom. I mean, the word freedom has been uttered so infrequently on uh, the debate stages. It's just amazing. Yes, there is a chance that we could be in the national debates if we provide, if we pull high enough. But I do, because it's important, I think, for people to have the right information. And because I'm not a typical politician, I'm not going to sit here and, and you know, wave flowers in front of you and try and obfuscate the truth of what we're really facing here. Because the reality is, is that we have two opportunities. One is to pull high enough. And the second one is the lawsuit that the Libertarian Party has fi filed alongside the Green Party uh, and Governor Gary Johnson's institution, the One America uh, Foundation or uh, Institute. And uh, if that lawsuit is successful, theoretically, we would be invited into the debates. However, however, it is important for people to know. Uh, that theoretically, if that lawsuit were successful, the Commission on Presidential Debates would could potentially be dissolved uh, and uh, a new institution could be started to start the debates, meaning that the entire lawsuit would be a wash simply because, well, you know, other than the fact, <laughs> despite what Governor Gary Johnson thinks, you do have free association in the United States to a certain extent. Um, uh, but when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the presidential debates polling high enough, um, the truth is, is that they may just change that no you have to have 20 percent you know once you or, or they just may not include us in the polls so i don't lie to my supporters i tell them the truth hard truth about what we're facing i tell them honestly and, and it's actually better that way i found being a sort of new politician it's better to tell people the truth about everything up front 100 because then nobody's surprised and they're like, oh, Austin, I didn't realize you may be pro-life, but you're not religious. You know, I didn't you were you were trying to pull the wool over our eyes, you know, and, and I didn't want that. Uh, you know, five years ago, so I was on a dating website and someone pulled my dating profile and, and posted it. And, and, and then said they were going to write a big expose about my dating life from five years ago. Of course, I was single. So, you know, I'm on a dating site. But um, but I when I found out that article was going to be published, I just went ahead and grabbed it because I had the information and I just published it publicly. I was like, hey, just so you all know, tonight they're going to write about my sex life from five years ago. And here you go. And enjoy and feel free to pick me apart and make fun of me and laugh all you want. So that in that way, I got ahead of the news and, and uh, got to, to get it out there. But when it comes to the Commission on Presidential Debates, we've gone from <laughs> my, from the debates to my, my private life. But um, when it comes to the debates, I want to tell my people the truth. I want them to know exactly what the, the challenges are that we face. I don't want to say that I'm going to get this and this is going to happen about the only thing that I am sure of right now is that I have a damn good shot of winning this nomination for president of the United States. And uh, whether or not I get into the debates or not, it doesn't matter. You know why? Because I'm going anyway. When the state of Colorado said, Austin, we're not we're uninviting you from our debates. And not only are we going to uninvite you, but we're get what they issued a gag order to the executive committee, said, which stated that none of them could tell me I was not invited. And of course, that information leaked. I drove 18 hours with my staff from Springfield, Illinois to Colorado Springs and showed up just in the nick of time, grabbed a microphone and walked out onto that stage. Uh, and that's the same kind of attitude that I'm going to bring to the national debate. So if they don't invite me, I'm going anyway. Love it. I like it. I like Love it. Matter of fact, I've always thought that the way you select a president is not so much. We don't know what issues are going to come up. We don't know what's going to happen a year or two into the office, but we can look at past behavior. And the fact that you've said, okay, hey, I'm going to be honest. Here's what's going on. I'll be forthright with you. And you'll take the initiative to move forward. I think that's a positive thing. And frankly, we see that that initiative that takes place with you and the other two gentlemen that uh, you are uh, debating with now. And I think the whole thing is about liberty and freedom. Yes, we have a difference right now, and that's okay. That's wonderful to bring those out. That's healthy, done in an amicable way, in a peaceful way. But uh, the whole point is to make sure that we have advanced and further the cause of liberty. 
and freedom and all of this. And you are doing this uh, very, very well, Austin. Well, another nice thing about using uh, the technology we have here is that we don't have a time limit. And yet at the same time, we also want to re be respectful for those uh, that it might have some other commitments. And Austin, what I want to do is uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for anything that you might want to add that I didn't ask or something that's been on your mind you've been wanting to say, you wanted a platform for it. Here's your platform. And by the way, there is no time limit on this. Uh, we want to hear from you. Any additional information you want to add to the public? Okay, sure. Well, um, one of the questions that I got in the debate yesterday, which is something that um, isn't talked about often uh, by libertarians, but that, or it is talked about often, but very few people uh, have very good solutions to the problem. And the question is, how do we get more people to join our cause? And people offer all sorts of different ideas or solutions or salves or bombs. And, and none of them, to me, have been satisfiable in terms of offering real solutions for getting real people involved in the libertarian movement who are curious about our ideas or who have never heard about our ideas. Uh, and my solution is one that um, is probably it, it is the most difficult thing for libertarians to conquer. The biggest challenge for libertarians doesn't lie with the government. It doesn't lie with statism. It doesn't lie with the, the, the endless wars. It doesn't lie with the IRS or the DEA. It, it has nothing to do externally. It has everything to do internally. Uh, and that internal struggle is that we believe we are right and everyone else is stupid and they all need to come to our level. When the reality is, is that we need to go out amongst the people and we have got to listen. We have got to be better listeners. And and I get frequently chided. I'm sorry. What did you say about that? What was that? Oh, never mind. <laughs> well, well, I'm I'm frequently chided. Frequently chided for being arrogant um, in the liberty movement because uh, because I do get frustrated with my fellow libertarians, and I do. I, I I guess maybe I have been guilty of talking down to them sometimes because I'm so frustrated with the failures of our of our leadership and of this movement to advance libertarian principles. I feel. Why do we? lose so always always fail 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 and it's because internally we do we will not go out to the people we are but we think we're better than everyone uh, and our ideas may be better than everyone else's ideas but with that comes this attitude of superiority which means that we come in and we lecture people uh, as soon as someone we hear someone say something we disagree with we verbally destroy them insult them and their mothers and uh, and then we make no friends we make no allies um, how to win friends and influence people, I would suggest to my libertarian friends. Um, find the issue that they're libertarian on first. Agree, everybody's a libertarian on something. Find the issue that they're libertarian on first. Agree with them, make That's friends cool. with them. Go out, sit on the front porch, drink a beer, talk about the issues you disagree with all night because you're already friends. And it doesn't matter if you disagree with them. It doesn't matter if they support Bernie Sanders. It doesn't matter if they support Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump because you're friends and you can talk about the issues. So our greatest challenges are with ourselves. Wow. I think that's profound, Austin. And that is something that really applies. Those of you watching this, think about what he just said. And if you're watching this on recording, you want to pause that and go back about 60 seconds and listen to that again. Wisdom there that we find those areas where we agree. Yes, we can find disagreements, and too often we jump to that. And by the way, I read this book here, and I've got the, uh, the facts behind me, and I want to bu uh, burst your bubble. Well, that doesn't win arguments. That doesn't win friends. And I like what you say, Austin. It makes a lot of sense that we've got to connect with people as, well, here's a concept, human beings. And as we do that, we tend to do a lot better. Thank you for saying that. Thank you, guys. And uh, if your uh, listeners or watchers are um, interested in more, uh, hearing more from me and my campaign, please go to austinforpresident.com. I'd obviously love a donation. Any amount is uh, appreciated. Uh, wristbands, you know, you can buy wristbands or bumper stickers. I, six months ago, I started this campaign in my apartment and I was licking stamps and mailing bumper stickers on my own personally and signing little, you know, the, the backs of envelopes to give people a little treat. And now here I am with a national campaign, a staff prepared to take a presidential nomination. We can accomplish incredible things if we just are willing to do the work and talk to people on the phone and just do the basic grassroots politicking that needs to be done. The liberty movement can win incredible victories, uh, but it does require some humility uh, and it does require hard work, even a presidential candidate needs to make phone calls. Even a presidential candidate needs to lick stamps and walk and, and, and do door knocking and walk uh, precincts and talk to people and shake their hands. This is how we build a revolution.
Yep, absolutely. And also, we want to make sure of those that li- might be listening via uh, audio that it's Austin for president, and that's Austin A U. S-T-I-N-F-O-R. We use the uh, word for F-O-R and president, like it sounds, P-R-E-S-I-D-E-N-T dot com. Austin for president. Go over there and then get the information and uh, say all of that that's there. Gina Carr, before we conclude, any final words from you? Just get registered for Freedom Fest doc- at freedomfest.com. Use FFTV, all caps, to get $100 off. And we just want to say thank you so much to Austin and thanks for being part of our party at the Libertarian uh, Party Convention. And just really thrilled for all of you guys that are in the audience that are there and the chat comments and the clapping that you've done for us. You know, tell people about this. We have a lot of recordings out there. So go out and look at some of the recordings that we've had where we interviewed uh, Greg Ryder, who's going to be the head of uh, Pitch Tank, yeah. which is like our Freedom Fest Shark Tank. Uh, next week, we oh, actually Thursday, we have Wayne Allen Root, who's going to be on board, former uh, vice president of the Libertarian Party candidate. Next week, we have John McAfee. And um, we're just constantly scheduling uh, these exciting guests for you. And so um, happy that you could be here. I hope you'll tune in again. Yes, absolutely. And uh, we're saying on behalf of Freedom Fest for Freedom Fest TV, we are glad to have you joining us. This is a pioneering effort. First time ever that Freedom Fest has had a broadcast like this where we can bring in people, we can talk, we can hear from you when we want to hear from you. Please let us know. And by the way, when if you're coming to the Libertarian Convention in Orlando, Gina and I are both planning to be there to uh, experience it, to see what's happening. We will look forward to meeting you. We want to talk to you. We'd love to shake your hand and hear from you. And of course, we'll be at Freedom Fest. Looking forward to that. I will be the MC for this year's event and looking forward to uh, being the host and going through uh, work. You talk about uh, herding cats. Oh, this will be real fun. Working with a bunch of libertarians. <laughs> Ought to be fun. And I'm eagerly looking forward to it. So this is Terry Brock on behalf of the entire Freedom Fest team and Freedom Fest TV. We want to thank Austin Peterson for being with us. Austin, you're a gentleman. Thank really you so much. appreciate you for having here and all that you're doing. See you in Vegas again. We'll see you then. See you in Take Orlando care and have a great Orlando day. Orlando first, Vegas then. All right. Have Orlando okay. first. Yes, indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, bye now.